This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for July 24th through the 30th. On this week's show, a woman with a big dream to take over the world and a legendary supergroup both debut. A movie with a classic soundtrack by a legend helps to create a new sound, a rebellious singer passes away, and Dylan plugs in and freaks out folk music fans, quite literally. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. We start with the date July 27th. July 27th was a big date in 1980s music lore because of a couple of events that were held in consecutive years. First up, Madonna was just a young woman with a dream. She went to college at the University of Michigan on a dance scholarship but wanted to go into ballet. At that point, she decided to drop out of college and do what any normal person with a dream would do. She moved halfway across the country to New York City with $35 in her pocket and pursued her dream. She started out with the usual small backup dancing gigs and working in fast food, specifically Dunkin' Donuts. Ah, the good old donkeys. During one of her backup gigs, she met a musician by the name of Dan Gilroy. They moved in together and formed a band called The Breakfast Club. She played guitar, drums, and sang in the group, and after a while, she left the band and formed another band called Emmy and the Emmys with Stephen Bray, who was also a former boyfriend. By this point, dance had taken a back seat, and she was all in on her music future. She decided that if she was going to land a record deal, she would have to do it as a solo act, even though she and Stephen Bray were still writing songs together for the group Emmy. Eventually, one of her demo tracks found its way to Sire Records, who signed her to a record deal. She released a couple of dance songs, which actually did really well on the Billboard dance charts, even though no one knew exactly who she was. Her first song, Everybody, was released in late 1982 and hit number three on the chart, while Burning Up was released in March of 1983 and hit the top five on the chart. At that point, she decided it was time to make her actual album. Her debut was originally produced by Reggie Lucas. However, Madonna wasn't happy with it, so she went to her new boyfriend, producer Jellybean Benitez. I'm sensing a theme here. He remixed the album, and on July 27, 1983, Madonna's debut album was released. Critically, it was not received well, to be nice about it. Rolling Stone magazine, in fact, said that she had an irritating voice. The critics didn't matter, though, in real life. The album did a slow burn up the Billboard albums chart, peaking at number eight. It was helped by the release of the singles Holiday, Borderline, and Lucky Star, and it was during this time that she and stylist Maripol cultivated her style with the lingerie being worn on top of regular clothes, lots of chains, fishnet stockings, crucifixes, and bracelets. By the time her second album, Like a Virgin, came out, she was ready to take over the world, as she liked to say. Her success even boosted some of the people who had helped her out. Jellybean Benitez became a sought-after producer and DJ. Madonna even sang on his big hit single, Sidewalk Talk. Madonna's first group, The Breakfast Club, got their own record deal, and they released an album that spawned the smash hit single, Right on Track. They were also nominated for a Best New Artist Grammy back in 1988. By that time, Stephen Bray had joined the band along with Dan Gilroy, and after they broke up, Stephen Bray went back to writing songs with Madonna, among many other artists such as the Jets and also Regina. All of this became possible, though, because of the release on July 27, 1983, of the debut album by the woman with the dream to take over the world, as she said on American Bandstand to Dick Clark, Madonna. On to the second July 27th event that happened one year after. In 1983, Prince was touring to support his fifth album, 1999. 
His management team decided that he should try to work his way into the movies like a lot of musicians do. The concept for the movie was based on Prince's life, but wasn't an exact biography. The film was written by Albert Magnoli and William Blinn. However, since the original script was dark, Magnoli decided to rewrite it and to also direct it. Prince's managers produced the movie. The casting for the female lead was a little tricky. Singer Vanity was supposed to be the original choice. However, before the filming started, she left the group Vanity Six, who were one of Prince's side projects. Prince decided to recast the lead role, so he offered it to Jennifer Beals, who turned it down in order to complete college. She still did pretty well with her career without it, though. She did Flashdance, among many other movies and TV shows lately. The role was then offered to Apollonia Cotero, who accepted it. The movie was filmed in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The First Avenue nightclub, where all of the concert shots were filmed, closed down for 25 days in order to film there. They were paid $100,000 for their troubles. They're also now a tourist attraction because of the film, so the deal worked out pretty well for them as well. The soundtrack album was the second album to also credit his band, The Revolution, as they did help to write some of the songs. Certain songs have a bit of a history. Let's Go Crazy is probably the best crafted song about moral ethics ever to be made. The line towards the end about how pills, thrills, and daffodils will kill is now ironic considering how Prince passed away. The famous drum machine intro after the organs in the beginning of the song is Prince's go-to drum machine, the Lin LM-1. Take Me With You was supposed to be for his side project Apollonia 6, but instead found its way onto the soundtrack. Contrary to popular belief, the female voice on the song is not actually Apollonia, and it is not Wendy and Lisa from The Revolution. It's actually singer Jill Jones. Computer Blue was originally a 14-minute song, but got cut back. I'm sure the original version turned up on the anniversary edition of Purple Rain now. Prince played all of the instruments on The Beautiful Ones and Darling Nikki, along with When Doves Cry. For Doves, he was trying to go with a different sound, so he pulled the bass line out of the song. I Would Die For You, Baby I'm a Star, and Purple Rain were all actually recorded a year before at a benefit concert for the Minnesota Dance Theater on August 3rd, 1983, at the now-famous First Avenue Club, Prince debuted those three songs as well as his new guitarist, Wendy Melvoin, who joined the revolution. Darling Nikki was partially responsible for censorship labels. A teenage girl listened to Darling Nikki in her house when her mother walked into the room and was horrified to hear the lyrics. The girl's mother was Tipper Gore, whose husband at the time was then-Senator, eventually the Vice President, Al Gore, also father of the Internet and father of planet Earth. I'm kidding. Tipper started an advocacy group called the PMRC, or Parents Music Resource Center, whose group put out a list of songs called the Filthy Fifteen, with Darling Nikki being front and center on that list. Tipper and her new powerful political group used their political connections to get Tipper's husband, Al, to do a dog and pony show congressional hearing where senators could look like they were being tough on the music industry. And honestly, when you can get Frank Zappa, John Denver, and Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister all in the same room screaming at senators, you know you've kind of done something right. Or something wrong. I don't know which, to be honest with you. In the end, though, the music industry agreed to put censorship stickers and labels on their albums and singles. If you kids are wondering what the censorship stickers are... Yeah, they're those things that you actually just now ignore and don't even bother paying any attention to. Trust me, we didn't either. Back then, they were just things that made kids like me want to buy whatever had a sticker on it. Because if it was going to piss off my parents, then I was going to buy it. A lot of kids did that. In other words, it was a brilliant marketing move for the record labels. So, good job, Tipper. Nice job. 
Oh, dear Lord. Anyway, the title track of the album has its own history. According to the Revolution's keyboardist, Dr. Fink, Prince wanted to write a song that sounded almost like it could have come from Bob Seger. The band Journey, though, tells a different story. According to them, Prince called them up one day and mentioned that he had written a song that sounded a lot like their hit song, Faithfully. He wanted their blessing, so of course they wouldn't sue him. Not only did they give him their blessing once they heard the song, but they thanked him for actually asking them, since a lot of bands had ripped off their sound without even asking them first. And if you actually listen to both Purple Rain and Faithfully Back to Back, and you pay attention especially to the chord changes, you will definitely hear those similarities. The first single for the soundtrack album, When Doves Cry, was released on May 16, 1984. Purple Rain, the album, came out on June 25, 1984, and spent 32 weeks on the Billboard Albums Chart's top 10, taking the number one spot for 24 straight weeks. By the time the movie was released on July 27, 1984, the world was ready to see the visuals that went along with the album. The movie was a big hit, considering... With a budget of $7.2 million, it went on to make $80 million worldwide. Purple Rain, the movie, and the soundtrack made rumpled pirate shirts a fashion trend, along with being the basis of a now-famous Seinfeld episode. It also gave Prince a lot of awards, including Grammys, a Golden Globe, and also an Academy Award for Best Music Score. It also is now considered a classic album and one of the greatest albums ever made. And the movie made stars of pretty much everyone associated with it, from Apollonia to even the group The Time. The Minneapolis Sound, as it was called, became the next musical trend, spawning groups like Tamara and the Scene to Sheila E. to Ready for the World to Maserati. Prince's career, of course, went to the next level and he achieved superstardom with the album. And it all started when Purple Rain, the film, premiered on July 27th, 1984. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. In 1985, Prince was in an extremely creative zone. Not only was he riding high off of the success of Purple Rain, he was also working on his next album, Around the World in a Day, along with material for the next official album after that called Parade, a solo album as an alter ego called Camille, and an album with his band The Revolution called Dream Factory. Both Dream Factory and Camille would be reworked into Prince's album Sign of the Times and also Crystal Ball, which was released by his estate after his untimely death in 2016. While Prince was doing all of that, he was also producing and doing side projects with other bands. One of those side projects was with a group called The Family. They released one album called The Family because, as we all know by now, you cannot officially be considered a recording act until you name an album after yourself. Dems the rules. Anyway, there was one song on that album that Prince wrote that, much like the album that it came from, received very little attention, at least from the general public. As it turns out, though, one artist did notice the song and wrote it to international superstardom. Sinead O'Connor was born on December 8, 1966 in Dublin, Ireland, as the third of five children. Sinead released her critically hailed debut album, The Lion and the Cobra, in 1988, which, to be honest, is my absolute favorite album of hers. That album had some cult hits on it, like Lay Your Hands on Me, Troy, and Mandinga, which earned her a Best Female Rock Vocal Performance Grammy nomination. 
in 1989, Sinead got to work on her sophomore album. As she was working on material for the album, she came across the family's version of Prince's song. The song about loss struck a chord in Sinead that reminded her of the loss of her mother, who she said abused her as a child, but who was killed in a car accident in 1985 before Sinead made a name for herself. Sinead recorded a 5-minute, 10-second power ballad version of the song, Nothing Compares to You, with her producer, Nellie Hooper. Her record label, Chrysalis, put it on her new album, I Do Not Want What I Have Not Got and released the song on January 8, 1990. The John Maybury-directed music video for it had just a single camera trained on her face with an all-black background, with a couple of cuts of Sinead walking through the Parc de Saint-Cloud in Paris, France, thrown in just for a few seconds. The parts where she's crying while she's singing were real. She actually shed real tears for the video. They were not computer-edited. Both the single and the music video were international smash hits. The single went top five in 20 different countries, 18 of them number one, including America, while the album that it came from topped the charts as well. Critically, the song was huge, with extremely good reviews. Sinead was lauded for her vocal skills in the song, going from anger to a whisper and then back over and over again and not missing a beat while doing it. When you hear her singing that song, you would swear that she was the one who wrote it because you believe she's feeling everything that she's singing in real time. Sinead's version of the song has also made a ton of different greatest songs of the 90s and also of all time lists. The single then went on to be nominated for a bunch of awards, including a few Grammy Awards, while the music video cleaned house at that year's MTV Video Music Awards, winning Best Female Video, Best Postmodern Video, and Video of the Year, making Sinead the first female artist to take home the coveted Video of the Year prize. In 1993, Prince would release his own version of the song, but as beautiful as his version is, Sinead just nailed it better. And it's one of those times that a cover version of a song is actually better than the original. However, Nothing Compares to You and Purple Rain were the two songs most played when Prince would tragically pass away in 2016. In fact, there was a worldwide radio simulcast of Sinead's version of Nothing Compares to You exactly 15 days and 7 hours after Prince passed away in honor of the lyric that starts off the song, It's been 7 hours and 15 days since you took your love away. In short, it's an extremely well-written song, as you would expect Prince to have written, along with being one of the most emotional, gut-punching vocal performances of the past 50 years, as sung by Sinead. Now, every generation needs an artist who pushes those buttons and agitates in order for some conversations to start and for progress to move forward. Sinead was definitely one of those artists for Generation X. In fact, she was a wrecking ball, but it was her cost for having strong opinions and having a voice to say them, and she gladly paid that price. In order to understand Sinead's impact, you have to remember the times and the place that she came from. Ultraconservatism was huge in the Western world in the 1980s and even into the late 1990s. Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush were the presidents in that era in America. The moral majority Christian conservatives were in control of the media and government in America. In the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher and John Major were prime ministers during that time. In Ireland, you had, of course, the battles and the bloodshed between the Catholics and the Protestants and also the power of the Catholic Church. The Irish part is what molded Sinead. The American part is what almost crushed her career completely, or rather, as she put it, the career her record label wanted her to have. After the success of the album, I Do Not Want What I Have Not Got, and also the song, Nothing Compares to You, Sinead became one of more than a few artists who bit the hand that fed her and rightfully railed against the music industry, famously boycotting the Grammy Awards in 1991 at the height of her popularity. 
She boycotted a performance on Saturday Night Live when it was announced that the guest host that night would be shock comedian Andrew Dice Clay, who was known at the time for making misogynistic jokes, to be nice about it. She said that she would not play in a stadium that featured the American National Anthem before her concert, which got Frank Sinatra so angry that he said during his own performance that he would, quote, kick her ass, end quote. She took on abuse by the Catholic Church by ripping up a photo of the Pope during a performance on Saturday Night Live on October 3rd, 1992, and then screamed, quote, fight the real enemy, end quote, which got her into a ton of trouble and derailed her career for a time in America. During the next week's episode of Saturday Night Live, then guest host Joe Pesci held up the retaped photo of the Pope and said that if he were the host that night, he would have, quote, hit her, end quote. To which the audience applauded loudly because hitting women is good in the 90s? Whatever. Even famous church agitator Madonna went after Sinead for doing what she did though most people then pointed out Madonna's hypocrisy and history and figured that Madonna just needed a little extra publicity for that sex photo book that she was selling at the time. A few weeks after that, Sinead was booed mightily at a Bob Dylan tribute concert. On stage, fellow performer Chris Christofferson kept her close to him, protected her from the crowd, gave her a hug and said to her, quote, don't let the bastards get you down, end quote. Funny thing was, Sinead was years ahead of her time in protesting the sexual abuses of the Catholic Church, as the accusations of sexual abuse by priests and the cover-up by the Catholic Church would start to become news in the media and in the court systems, especially worldwide, about a decade or so later. Then there was Sinead's search for meaning in her life through different religions. She was ordained as a minister in the Latin Trinidine Church, which is a denomination of the Catholic Church that is not under the Pope's control, and at least in 1999 it wasn't. She then converted to Islam in 2018. As people have aptly pointed out, she had her struggles with mental health issues for decades, including being hospitalized after sending out tweets where she had talked about killing herself. She had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Ironically, her son Shane, whom she lost custody of when he was 13 to Shane's father due to her mental health issues, himself committed suicide in early 2022. Throughout all of this, Sinead had put out nine more albums after the success of I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, and while they did not have the same success in America that that album actually did, her other albums did garner her a bunch of various award nominations. In 2021, she released her memoirs and announced her retirement from the music industry. There was recent talk that she was working on a new album that was going to be put out in 2024 and that a tour, at least a small one, would soon follow. However, on July 26, 2023, Sinead had passed away from natural causes in London, England at the age of 56. In death, there have been the usual tributes from celebrities, some who knew her and most who didn't but act like they did because they saw her at an event here or there. I guess that counts as friendship in celebrity circles. Only the few people who she called friends were really there for her when she needed them. Others either made fun of her issues while she was alive or talked down to her when she would offer advice to not sexualize themselves for the music industry, which was the advice that she actually had given to Miley Cyrus when Miley was going through that phase in her career, to which Miley attacked Sinead and told her to seek help. Sinead had also said wild things about celebrities sometimes during her many mental health episodes, such as accusing Arsenio Hall and Eddie Murphy of giving Prince the painkillers that eventually killed him. Still, in an era where no one stood for anything, or only pushed buttons because it either got them attention or a payday, much like today's era of influencers and reality show stars, I might add, Sinead stood up for what she felt was right, 
and stood against for what she felt was wrong, regardless of the personal or professional cost. She spoke out about racism, especially in the music industry, sexual abuse, a woman's right to choose, the events in Northern Ireland at the time, and human rights. And she never backed down from anything or anyone, unless she felt that she might have aimed her weapon of choice at the wrong person, which happened sometimes. She also, for the record, apologized to Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall for what she said was a screw-up on her part. She was also open and honest about everything in her life, including her own fallacies. Even her signature shaved head was partially an act of rebellion, since her record label wanted her to grow her hair long to make her, in their words, quote, more feminine, end quote. Sinead wasn't about sexualizing herself for her fans. She let her music do the talking for her because Lord knows she left it all out there in her music for everyone to see and hear. In short, Sinead O'Connor was a badass. The world could use more people like Sinead. Unfortunately, these days, her like rarely walk the earth anymore. The death of the incomparable Sinead O'Connor. July 26, 2023, from Natural Causes in London, England, at the age of 56. I am not going to do my usual birthday person breakdowns this week because of these next couple of events that need to fill up that spot. However, let me give some personal shout outs to some happy birthdays this week to people like Mick Jagger, also Kate Bush, Buddy Guy, Getty Lee of Rush, Jennifer Lopez, and Broadway superstar Kristen Chenoweth. Now, on to the next story. On July 26th, 1965, an event so destructive to the sanctity of life itself took place that it is still talked about to this very day. Women still cry. Men with long hair still smoke a joint before telling the dark, twisted tale of how Bob Dylan went electric at the Newport Folk Festival. Seriously, people, this was a huge deal back then, at least to the folk crowd. I'll explain. See, back in the early to mid-1960s, Bob Dylan was huge. I'm not sure how to describe it in today's terms because there was no one like him these days. That's probably why he's still so revered. In the 60s, folk music became all the rage. The group The Birds kind of kicked it into the mainstream when their cover, ironically, of Dylan's song, Mr. Tambourine Man, broke through to the mainstream. But by then, Dylan was already the king of folk music. That was helped in no small part to his performance at the Newport Folk Festival in 1964. He was then introduced by Ronnie Gilbert of the Weavers, who said, quote, And here he is. Take him. You know him, he's yours, end quote. Folk people apparently took that all to heart. To them, Bob Dylan was the Pied Piper. By the 1965 Newport Folk Festival, which was held at Festival Field, the crowd that proclaimed him as theirs was ready for their Lord and Savior to return. What this crowd didn't realize was that by this time, Bob Dylan was going in a different direction. Only months earlier, he decided not to go with an acoustic sound, and instead, he embraced the electric guitar. He recorded the now classic song Like a Rolling Stone months earlier, and had actually released it five days before his appearance at the festival, so the crowd was not ready for this new sound of his. So, how would they react? Well, um, eh, not well. In fact, hate doesn't even begin to describe their reaction. Bob went on stage, plugged in his guitar, and went into an electric version of his acoustic hit, Maggie's Farm. The crowd went wild, and by wild I mean they booed, screamed, and said some really not nice things to him. One guy even famously called him Judas. 
Bob continued the set with Like a Rolling Stone, It Takes a Lot to Laugh, It Takes a Train to Cry, and then finished up with the two-song acoustic encore of It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, and Mr. Tambourine Man. Dylan was actually shocked by the reaction, but his decision was final. He continued playing and recording with the electric guitar and continued on with his vision. It's not clear if his crowd ever forgave him for changing his style, but it really didn't matter. So, yeah, kids, Bob Dylan going electric really was a big deal back then. And he did it all at the Newport Folk Festival on July 25th, 1965. Finally, the group Cream was the first rock supergroup and one of the most brilliant groups of the late 1960s with four albums that lit the rock world on fire. As brilliant and talented as they were, though, they were also one of the most volatile groups in the world. The volatility eventually drove them apart and it would take decades before they would play together again. The group was a byproduct of other very successful groups of the 1960s. Eric Clapton was at that time already considered one of the greatest blues guitarists of all time, or as a famous wall graffiti said, Clapton is God. He played in the Yardbirds and was just finishing up with John Mayle and the Bluesbreakers. Drummer Ginger Baker was leaving the group the Graham Bond organization, and bassist Jack Bruce had already left the Graham Bond organization rather unceremoniously, and we'll get to that part in a second. One night after watching Clapton performing with John Mayo, Baker gave Clapton a ride back to Clapton's home in London, England, and during the ride, Baker mentioned that he was starting a new band and wanted Clapton to join him. Eric said yes, but only if Jack Bruce could join and play bass. Baker, according to Clapton, almost crashed the car when he mentioned Bruce. See, Clapton and Bruce originally met when they were in the Blues Breakers and then in a side project band with Steve Winwood of Traffic and Paul Jones of Manfred Mann called Powerhouse. From Eric's standpoint, Jack was good people. Ginger and Jack, though? Eh, not so kosher. Actually, to say that Ginger and Jack didn't get along is also an understatement. See, while they were in the Graham Bond organization, they would break each other's instruments. Things got so bad that they had fights while on stage performing. Ginger had Jack fired from Graham Bond, but Jack still showed up at the gigs like he was still in the band. At least until one night when Ginger pulled out a knife and threatened Jack with it. Ginger really wanted Eric in the band, and Eric really wanted Jack in the band, so Ginger and Jack agreed to at least try to get along and make this band work, much like how parents try to stay together for the sake of the children. The band officially formed on July 16, 1966, and considered going by the name Sweet and Sour Rock and Roll, then The Cream before finally just going by Cream. It was decided that Jack would take lead singing duties since Eric was pretty shy about singing and Ginger, being the drummer, didn't want to have anything to do with singing. The trio performed together for the first time on July 29, 1966 at the Twisted Wheel nightclub in Manchester, England. Since they didn't have a lot of original songs worked up, They put their own spin on blues classics and played three songs, a cover of Willie Dixon's Spoonful, a cover of Robert Johnson's Crossroad Blues, which Clapton would then make famous a few times, and a cover of Skip James's I'm So Glad. In the early days of their tenure, for one night, they actually became a quartet when a fan of Clapton's, who was just starting to make a name for himself in London, England, sat in with the guys. That man was Jimi Hendrix. Cream's first album was called Fresh Cream and was released late in 1966. The album performed okay on the charts, going to number six in Great Britain and number 39 in America. The writing duties were split pretty much between the three of them, 
when they came to America to play some gigs, it wasn't really a big deal at that point, as people still didn't know who they were. At the time, Clapton was only well known to other musicians in America. He wasn't a household name, as he had left the Yardbirds just before that band had made it big in America. When Cream first played, they were in the middle of lineups at music festivals, and sometimes they only actually got to play one song, and then they had to leave. Still, it didn't stop them from coming back to America to record their next album, Disraeli Gears. That album was recorded in five days in May of 1967 in New York City and was released in November of that year. The album has the classics Sunshine of Your Love and Tales of Brave Ulysses. It also showed the range of the band as they combined psychedelic and blues rock. Right after they finished recording the album, they played in San Francisco and Los Angeles. At that point, they started to make a name for themselves with legendary shows where they played some songs for 20 minutes each. By the time their third album, the double album Wheels of Fire, came out in 1968, they were kings, with Wheels going to number one in America on the strength of songs like White Room. The problem was that by then the band had pretty much gotten sick of touring and doing extended jam sessions on stage. And, of course, the tension between Bruce and Baker became a problem again. Clapton always had to be the middleman, but even he was getting sick of dealing with everybody. According to legend, Clapton decided that he was through with Cream after Rolling Stone magazine reviewer and future Bruce Springsteen producer John Landau gave both the band and Clapton a really bad review, calling Clapton, quote, the king of the blues cliché, end quote. The band announced that they were done in 1968. However, they were talked into doing one final album. Called Goodbye, it was recorded towards the end of 1968 and was released in early 1969. The song Badge is from that album. What has been forgotten throughout the decades, though, is that by the time Goodbye came out, Cream had already left. They played a final tour, played two concerts in London that were recorded, and in late 1968, before Goodbye came out, the band called it quits. Baker and Clapton then got Steve Winwood to join them by making another supergroup. They called that one Blind Faith. may have heard of them. Clapton then went on to form Delaney and Bonnie, Derek and the Dominoes, until having an extremely successful solo career. Ginger Baker, meanwhile, went on to form Ginger Baker's Air Force, while Bruce went on to have a so-so solo career. 25 years after they broke up, they got back together and performed when they were inducted together into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Based on that performance, they decided to do some limited concerts together, but due to their other projects, the trio didn't actually do a reunion tour until 2005, with mixed results. There was talk around 2007 about doing another concert, but that never happened. Of course, now there is zero chance of a reunion, as Jack Bruce passed away in 2014, Ginger Baker passed away in 2019, and Eric Clapton announced that due to bad health with his muscle control, he can't really perform that much anymore. The supergroup Cream, playing their first gig to start it all off at the Twisted Wheel nightclub in Manchester, England, on July 29th. 1966. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for July 24th through the 30th. Thanks for listening. <laughs>